Now, all of you uh, are obviously here because you are uh, fans of aviation and fans of aviation on film. Uh, that will be today's subject. I have promised several members of the audience that there will be no score updates of any kind uh, during the presentation. So we ask you to uh, ask you to please uh, follow through on that. Uh, so uh, that's that's most important part. But uh, now, as far as uh, today's presentation is concerned, I'm really excited about this. Uh, maybe you're like me that that. Uh, your entry into the world of aviation and the marvel of aviation we may have happened one of two ways, either at an air show, uh, seeing planes fly overhead for the first time, doing things that just seemed impossible to the naked eye, or uh, on film. One of the first aviation films I ever saw, uh, and is still my favorite to this day, is the epic Tora Tora Tora. And, uh, and I see a lot of people nodding heads out there. It's far and away my, my favorite uh, aviation film, but there are so many. And when I first encountered Mark Carlson's book, uh, two things struck me. One wow, this guy really knows a lot about aviation and movies and must really love them. And two, this is a very, very well-researched and thoughtful and very engaging book uh, about uh, aviation and the people who love to film them and the people who love to watch films about them. Uh, Mark uh, considers himself a historian, and I have to agree with him on this. He's very much uh, been very meticulous in this. He's interviewed a number of different people who have been involved in both uh, aviation and aviation on film, and has a number of fascinating stories that I know uh, all of you will want to hear. Uh, there is, uh, he has mentioned that he is working on a, another book, but it's going to be about aviation on television. It's not going to be a, a, about a film, but I will let him uh, take care of that uh, for most of you. Uh, is there anything else, Mark, you want me to cover before you get started? Doing pretty good. Doing pretty well? Okay. Very good. Uh, so without uh, further ado, if you would please join me in welcoming uh, our guest today at the Museum of Flight, Mark Carlson. There you go. There's the mic, and it is live. Thank you very much, J.D. And thank you all of you for braving the weather to come out and be in here and not be at the game. I'm grateful. I really am. Okay. A um, couple things that I will mention about myself. Uh, some of you may have noticed this beautiful yellow Labrador lying down here. Her name is Saffron. She's my guide dog. Yeah, I'm uh, legally blind. Okay, a blind guy writing a book about the movies. <laughs> yeah, I did it. But I have always loved aviation. I've always loved the movies. And through a quirk of fate, I decided to write a book about the, uh, the two things that Give me the most joy, and the result is flying on film, a century of aviation in the movie, 1912 to 2012. It covers 100 years of aviation and film. And being up here at the prestigious museum and meeting the wonderful staff and volunteers who, who do so much, who are so dedicated to collecting, restoring, preserving aviation history and aviation heritage, is truly a, a labor of love, and I think they are all fantastic people, and it's a wonderful institution, and I'm very proud to be here. When I first started coming up with the idea of doing this book, it came out by accident almost, as most things do. I have a lot of veteran friends. I write a lot of art aviation articles, you know, aviation military history, uh, aviation history article for a lot of national magazines, and I know a lot of veterans. I know a lot of people who fought in the in the Second World War in Korea and Vietnam. And once in a while, I'll be sitting down with one of these guys, and I'll be talking to him, and I'll just come right out and say, hey, what did you think of this movie, or what did you think of that movie? My, the answers I got usually surprised me. And I would often get responses, that, well, no, that movie wasn't any good, but I'll tell you what I think was a great movie. And little by little, started thinking, no, you know, that's kind of interesting, because I've never come across an aviation movie book that actually talk to the veterans, to talk to the people who were there and had done that, to, to learn what they really thought of it, what was done right, what was done wrong. And so when I started putting together this book, I started interviewing a lot of people I already knew. And they led me to other people and so on. I've talked to stunt pilots like Steve Hinton, uh, Roscoe Brown, one of the Tuskegee Airmen, um, General Bob Cardenas, who was part of the X-1 project, uh, Rear Admiral James D. J. Dog Ramage was a dive bomber pilot in the Second World War. And Colonel Steve Pisanos, a double ace in the Second World War. 
Doug Corrigan Jr., wrong way Corrigan, son, uh, the commander of Top Gun. There's more than 200 people all together. I talked to Dave Thatcher, who was one of the, the, one of the last surviving Doolittle Raiders. And every one of these interviews not only went into the book, but they were a treasure trove of information, trivia, and I felt very honored to have the opportunity to talk to these people, to learn their stories, and to, to hear what they actually had to say. Some of them are no longer with us, and I have felt very honored that I did have the chance to talk to them and learn from them. I talked to some actors, including Cliff Robertson, who's no longer with us now, Lewis Gossett Jr., Ephraim Zimbalist, David McCallum, Jack Larson, Sean Astin, among others. When I was looking at the history of aviation and film, you know, it goes back more than 100 years, but it was really getting kind of tough finding anybody who was actually involved in a movie in 1912. So the earliest, or the latest film that I could actually, actually talk to people who were participating in it was in 1948, and that was Fighter Squadron with uh, Edmund O'Brien and Robert Stack and Jack Larson. From that point on, I had to go primarily to uh, other archival sources. But I was very, very lucky for all the people that, that were so helpful. Well, where did it all begin? I'll give you a quick piece of history here. This period of aviation and history, aviation and the movies started at almost exactly the same time in history. The Wright brothers made their first flight in 1903, and just a year before, the French director, Georges Méliès, had directed La Voyage Jean de Luna, the very first major science fiction movie. The two industries were in their infancy at that time. Nobody really knew what their future was, or if there even was a future. But as the next decade showed, and they started to grow in strength and become more popular, more vibrant, and they were still at it and getting better at what they were doing. They found each other around 1905. The very first images of a, uh, a Wright Flyer was filmed some, some places around uh, North Carolina. And then by 1910, movies, the early movies, this early short silence, were featuring aircraft. And in the warm, comfortable land of Southern California, they all came together. It's no accident that the, the motion picture studios like Biograph and Famous Players Lasky and Hal Roach and Senate started in Southern California right alongside Martin and Douglas and Lockheed and Ryan, a North American. So we're all coming together in the same place at the same time. And the, the uh, exhibition pilots needed work. They started working for the motion picture studios. The airplanes helped to sell the pictures, and the pictures helped to advertise the airplane. A lot of times, the very first images people ever had of airplanes was in motion pictures. And of course, it, it increased the interest. What's amazing is how many of the pilots who were the stunt pilots for that era survived that era. They, they pulled off stunts. That, there was no regulation in those days. If a director or a screenwriter had an idea and a pilot said, yeah, I can do that, no problem. They got away with things that would make a litigation lawyer drool today. But as it got to be a little more regulated and a little more careful, then aviation was starting to be seen as a serious business, and so were the motion pictures. 1912 was the very first year that a movie that could be considered an aviation film with a Mabel Norman silent called a dash through the cloud. Mabel Norman was a heroine like um, Pauline um, Pearl White. And from that point on, they just kept on going, and more wild ideas. But what had happened during the, the Great War, that was the, that was the watershed moment for aviation film, because the Great War was a huge event for that era. And when uh, a writer named John Monk Saunders went to Jesse Lasky, a famous player's Lasky, which eventually became Paramount, and he had a screenplay for a story called Wings, and he took it to Lasky, 
And Lansky liked the idea, and he said, all right, we need a good director. And he reached down into a pool of directors and found a young, hot-headed guy whose nickname was Wild Bill. That was William A. Wellman, who had actually served in the Lafayette Flying Corps during the war. And he knew what aerial combat looked like. And Lasky gave it to Wil Wilman, and Wilman went on to produce what was, and I still believe, is the greatest aviation film ever made. In 1927, Wings. It won the very first Academy Award for, motion, uh, for best motion picture. Well, Wilman literally won the Triple Crown on his very first time on horseback with that movie. And he set a standard that has almost never been equaled. Wings told a remarkable uh, story. Um, I was lucky enough to talk to William Wellman, Jr. We got, we've gotten to be very good friends. And he told me so much about the making of the movie and what his father's, um, his, his father's background and the trivia about the making of the movie that, that really set it apart and made it come to life for me. I, have, I saw Wings for the first time when I was about 10 years old, and I was captivated by it, but I had no idea what I was watching. It wasn't until years later when I really started researching the film that I began to understand it. Wings was filmed down in Texas at Kelly Field and Camp Stanley near um, San Antonio. And in order to gather together enough airplanes, there, there weren't a lot of original wartime planes in 1926, 1927. So Lasky had to gather together what they could, and in some cases they had to use uh, existing current army planes. They couldn't get a hold of any, of any of the German Albatross fighters, so they used the Curtis P-1 Hawk and repainted it. And these were the ones that played the part of the Albatross in Captain Von Kellerman's Flying Circus for the movie. All of this filming was done in the sky with real airplanes, real pilots, and real cameras. The new, new kind of technology that actually allowed photography to be done in the air. When you're watching wings, you are seeing the real thing. You're watching actual aircraft up there, cameras shooting from one plane to another, and real dogfight sequences. It's not faked. There's only a couple of simulated situation, a couple of crash sequences, but even they use real airplanes. And one of the great stuntmen of his era was this man, Dick Grace, the stunt, the crash king of Hollywood in the 1920s and 1930s. Dick Grace survived 38 crashes that he did on purpose. And two of them appear in wings, in which, one in which he crashed a spad the one, the lower, the lower picture, he was actually supposed to hit a spot right next to the Allied line when Jack, the hero of the movie, got shot down. And they had dug up a section of the ground and made it nice and soft so he had a soft place to hit. They tore up, the, they pulled out all the barbed wire and the metal stakes, and they put in wooden stakes and twine. And this is the place he was going to hit. Dick's aim was a bit off that day. And he smacked into the real barbed wire. There was a metal sheath inside the Spad's cockpit, which protected him, luckily, because the plane really got torn apart when he hit. The second crash involving a real Fokker D7 resulted in a broken neck, which he didn't know about. He later found out that he had broken his neck, but he was back at work three days later. So Dick Grace was one of the unsung heroes of Wings, and he had set a standard for, for piloting and for stunt work that impressed a man named Howard Hughes. Howard Hughes wasn't satisfied with just being a tool and die maker. He wanted to get into something else, and he saw Wing, and since he was already filthy rich, he said, I want to start making movies. And he saw Wing so many times that he decided that he wanted to make a war, air war movie. And that became Hell's Angels. Now, because he had so much money going for him, there's nothing holding him back like, say, talent or experience. Um, he um, collected what was the largest privately owned Air Force in the world at the time. 
He got a few original aircraft, but where he couldn't get originals, he had them modified. Took Thomas Moore's scouts and turned them into Sopwith Camel and Travel Air 2000s and had them modified to look like Fokker D7. Those Travel Air Fokker D7s were called Wichita Fokkers for many years afterwards. He used the same kind of techniques that were pioneered by Harry Perry and William Wellman in Wing. Hell's Angels is a kind of a silly story in, in the plot line, but it has some spectacular aerial sequences, including a, a, a Zeppelin, burning, burning German Zeppelin, that was done extremely realistically six years before the Hindenburg exploded. There's one notable aircraft in the... Um, yes, there's one notable aircraft in, uh, in Hell's Angels, the one and only Sikorsky S-29A. It was designed by Igor Sikorsky in the early 1920s as a transport. Uh, he was hoping it would generate more interest in sales, but it, it didn't happen, and the plane never had any other built of that type. Roscoe Turner, the famed pilot Roscoe Turner, bought it and, and used it to, to ferry heavy things around like pianos, and he delivered it to, um, to Hughes and rented it to Hughes to be used in the movie as a Gotha bomber. Well, the whole sequence with the, uh, the Sikorsky S-29 in combat being shot at by the enemy fighters uh, is it's pretty spectacular, but the ending is the one that really stands out. Because the pilot was a, stunt, a famed stunt pilot fly, flyer named Al Wilson, and there was a mechanic inside the fuselage, um, Bill Jones. And at the one point when the plane was supposed to be shot down, Wilson and Jones would bail out. Jones was supposed to light the squib and the pyrotechnic, and then they would both bail out. Well, Wilson got out, but Jones didn't. So when that plane crashes, Phil Jones is killed in that scene. Let's take on a different. This is probably one of the most iconic ending sequences in American film history. We all remember when Kong was up on the Empire State Building, Beauty and the Beast, I always felt sorry for him. <laughs> I don't know, call me a, bit, a big softy, but I, you know, <laughs> King Kong is one of, one of Hollywood's great films. And we all remember the, the Navy fighters going up there to shoot Kong down, shoot him off the building. Well, those aircraft were Curtis OSC-2s, also known as the, uh, the Curtis Falcon, used by both the, Na the, used by the Navy and the Marine Corps. And the, um, the production built several models of 12-inch wingspan, 24-inch wingspan, and 36-inch wingspan in order to force the perspective, to show planes that diff of different sizes at different distances, to force the perspective and make it look like they were actually flying, and it was a great m deal more distant. But what I really like about this is when, if you watch the movie, and you'll notice one sequence in which there's a close-up, a mock-up of the cockpit, and you see the, the pilot and the gunner, and the gunner sitting right behind him with a ring mount. And they're flying towards Kong. And the pilot is kind of looking around like this, and the gunner, who's right behind him, swings around, and he starts tapping the pilot on the shoulder. And then he's pointing down as if they, no, no, it's the ape on that building over there. <laughs> Interestingly, the pilot is named Miriam C. Cooper. He was the director of the movie. And Ernst Schoenstack, the producer, was the gunner. And as Miriam Cooper had said in a, um, in an interview many years later, he said, well, we created him. We figured that we should shoot the SOB down ourselves. Miriam C. Cooper later went on to become famous as Claire Chenault's deputy in the, fly in the AVG, the American Volunteer Group in the Flying Tigers. But he used to be a movie director. There's a chapter about biography that I call it, This Is Your Life, Hollywood Style. And I write about the biographies of... of uh, Lindbergh and um, Doug, Doug Corrigan, among others. And Amelia Earhart, there have been five Amelia Earhart movies. We can't get enough of Amelia. 
The most recent one, Amelia with Hillary Swank, is probably the most historically accurate. What's notable in the film is the aircraft used. And the Ford trimotor you see in Amelia is a real aircraft. It is the oldest all-metal flying monoplane in the world. It's owned by a man named Greg Herrick. It is number C-1077. Why it is important, not only because it's the oldest flying one, but it actually had some notable pilots in its career. Charles Lindbergh once flew it, so did Floyd Bennett and Amelia herself. So when you're seeing that movie, you're looking at a plane that Amelia actually flew in. The Red Vega that you see in the film is a reproduction. It is now on display at the San Diego Air and Space Museum. The, um, the Fokker triplane, Fokker trimotor that she uses in her um, first uh, transatlantic flight is also a reproduction. The, uh, there are two Electras used in the film. They are a slightly different model than the actual Electra, but they are real Electras. So it's worth that, even if you're not interested in the love story. Flying Tigers with John Wayne was one of the very first successful war movies. It came out 